On this Tuesday night, BC's polarizing pipeline. Protests spread across Canada. The BC legislature gets blocked. But not all First Nations are opposed to this pipeline. We'll tell you why. More Canadians back home and under quarantine, while hundreds more remain confined to cruise ships. We're counting the days. Terrifying bus ride. And the teenagers who will live to tell the tale. Plus, discovering the Reaper of Death, the Tyrannosaur that once terrorized Alberta. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with protests that have popped up across this country, disrupting travel and trade. They're a show of solidarity for a small group of hereditary chiefs in northern British Columbia who don't want a natural gas pipeline crossing their land, even though it has the support of 20 elected band councils along the route. In Victoria, protesters blocked entrances to the provincial legislature hours before the spring session was due to start. And in Toronto, they obstructed a major intersection, bringing traffic to a standstill. And protesters are crippling rail lines, too. Via Rail says it's been forced to cancel 157 passenger trains because of protests on the tracks, disrupting travel for 24,000 people. And today, CN Rail said it's been forced to shut down parts of its network of freight trains. It is actually also illegal because it, uh, it infringes on the Railway Safety Act. For obvious reasons, uh, it's dangerous to, to actually block the rail, rails uh, when that is happening. And so we're very concerned about it from that point of view. The transport minister says it's up to the provinces to get injunctions to remove the protesters. What started as a blockade on a remote forest access road in northern B.C. has now become a rallying cry for supporters across the country who are using the hashtag ShutdownCanada. We'll take you to northern B.C. in just a moment, but we begin with Eric Sorensen on what the protesters want. More than 3,000 kilometres from the proposed gas pipeline in northern B.C., the Tyendinaga Mohawk have taken a stand in eastern Ontario. Via rail forced to cancel dozens of passenger trains through the most populated rail corridor in the country. CN says the impact is being felt beyond Canada's borders and is harming the country's reputation as a stable and viable supply chain partner. The dispute centres on the proposed coastal gas link pipeline in northern B.C. Several wet Sowetan bands along the route support it, but hereditary leaders by and large do not. And several protesters who set up blockades were arrested, sparking protests across the country. Here's the issue. The pipeline would deliver natural gas for export from near Dawson Creek, 670 kilometers to the Pacific coast at Kitimat. But the route bisects the wet Sowetan traditional territory. The protests began near Houston, B.C. But after the Mounties made arrests, the protests began to spread to the Port of Vancouver and the B.C. Legislature, and cities across the country. Some one-day protests. Others involve ongoing blockades of rail lines, CN lines in northern B.C. and in eastern Ontario, and a CP rail line near Montreal. A small blockade is all it takes on the Kahnawake Reserve outside Montreal. The snow-covered tracks tell the story. The trains aren't running. Protests in response began last week in B.C., including one outside the port of Vancouver. Today, at the container terminal in Halifax, a demonstration by Mi'kmaq First Nations showing coast-to-coast -coast solidarity. Enough is enough. We want Canada to wake up. This is not what reconciliation is. It's not what reconciliation should look like. One protest brought the dispute right into the Toronto offices of the Federal Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, Carolyn Bennett. They will never agree to a pipeline the minister would not comment publicly, but clearly doesn't want to be drawn into this dispute, issuing a statement that the coastal gas link project falls under provincial jurisdiction and that no order of government can direct the RCMP. But others say it's not just about a pipeline. It's about indigenous rights that Ottawa and the provinces cannot sidestep. This is about native sovereignty, native law, and the right to make decisions to what happens to them their nations and their lands. Why do we want it? Now! Indigenous and other protesters are relatively small in number, but they're showing the potential for disruption exists all over the country. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. 
The natural gas pipeline at the heart of this has the support of 20 elected band councils along the route. All of them have signed benefit agreements with Coastal Gas Link. They believe it will help communities become less reliant on federal funding. It's a few Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and their supporters who are blocking construction of it and who the RCMP have been arresting. Global Sarah McDonald is near the site in northern BC tonight. Sarah? Donna, court appearances today for those arrested here in northern BC on Monday, where that lucrative pipeline project is deeply divisive. Seven arrests at the longest standing holdout in Wet'suwet'en Nation outside of Houston, B.C. on Monday marked the end of the enforcement of the injunction. 28 people opposed to that natural gas pipeline have now been arrested for refusing to leave the unceded territory that pipeline is slated to run through. But many members of that same First Nation want the pipeline built. It's an initiative promising jobs and funding to Indigenous communities in exchange for access to their resources. It may be lucrative, but still, it's also polarizing, drawing a deep wedge between those for and against it. The benefits of our people working out there, that they, they have gainful employment and it, if they can provide for their families. I've not heard anybody who said, I love this pipeline, I'm so happy it's going ahead. What people have said is, I want the job. I want a good paying job. The livelihoods of many British Columbians in this region depend on that injunction remaining impactful and the road to their work site remaining clear of obstructions. The question is how long it will stay that way with work expected to resume this week. Donna. All right, Sarah McDonald in Smithers, B.C. Thanks. Progress is being made getting stranded Canadians out of the coronavirus outbreak zone. A second government chartered plane touched down this morning at CFB Trenton after flying overnight from China and making a refueling stop in Vancouver. The 188 passengers on board have now joined more than 200 others in a two-week quarantine. In China, the outbreak has reached a grim milestone. According to Chinese media, more than 1,100 people have now died and the virus is still spreading. There are now more than 44,000 confirmed cases, most of them in China. At the heart of the outbreak in the city of Wuhan, millions of people are still under quarantine. Information on what's happening on the ground there is limited. State-run media is posting video like this, patients dancing at a makeshift hospital, trying to show that people are staying positive. The situation in the region, though, remains bleak. Public frustration is building over how the outbreak has been handled. Today it was reported several senior Chinese officials have been punished. They were removed from their positions for dereliction of duty. The World Health Organization has finally come up with an official name for this strain of the virus. It's now called COVID-19. The head of the WHO says the name purposefully does not refer to any people, place or animals. That's to avoid any stigma. He describes the virus as public enemy number one and calls on the world to tackle the threat. A virus can have more powerful consequences than any terrorist action. We have to use the current window of opportunity to hit hard and stand in unison to fight this virus in every corner. Public health officials in Canada say the risk to Canadians is low. But as Mike LeCouture reports, they're taking no chances with those people returning from the epicenter of the outbreak. The second and likely last Canadian government evacuation flight from Wuhan, China, touched down at CFB Trenton in Ontario early Tuesday morning. 130 Canadians and 58 accompanying family members were on board. Hundreds of Canadians registered with Global Affairs remain in Hubei province. It's unclear if those people want to leave, but it's unlikely that the government will go get them. Each situation is different and we're assessing what kinds of supports are needed and whether or not more people want to come back from Hubei. Now, the ones who just returned will go through the same 14-day quarantine as the others who arrived home last week. But this latest group will be in a less modern facility. As a result, those housed at Hastings Hall will have to share bathrooms, according to Canada's chief public health officer. Thank you, then. Bye now. Elsewhere on the base, we're getting a sense of daily life through the lens of Joanna Wu, which includes people walking around in hazmat suits. The Vancouver native has been posting videos on YouTube documenting each day, from when she left Wuhan to the meals she's eating in Trenton. I actually went out yesterday to try to test the two meter rule because we're supposed to stay uh, away from people, like at least two meter. 
But then I walked around yesterday and it seemed like that wasn't very strict, like you could stand next to someone. The quarantine passengers on the Diamond Princess cruise ship are settling into a routine. BC man Nigel Cole says he and his husband are allowed brief walks on the promenade deck as they try to pass the time. Yeah, we're counting the days. It, it's, it's, we're not marking uh, marks on the wall yet, but as they do in the movies, we, we might come to that if <laughs> it goes beyond the 19th. That's when the quarantine should end, and that's when Cole and thousands of others on board hope they'll finally be able to head home. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. And Japanese public health officials now say 39 more people on board the Diamond Princess have tested positive for the virus. That brings the total on board that ship to 174. And there's trouble now for another cruise ship stranded at sea because of the coronavirus. The Westerdam, owned by Holland America, has been turned away from yet another port. The cruise ship left from Hong Kong on February 1st with more than 2,200 people on board, including 271 Canadians. It was supposed to be a 14-day trip with stops in Japan and Taiwan, but Japan refused to let the ship dock because of the coronavirus. Taiwan, the Philippines and the U.S. territory of Guam also barred its entry. It appeared yesterday the nightmare might end when the company announced it was headed for Bangkok, Thailand. But now Thai officials say they won't let passengers off the ship either. The company says it's trying to sort out the problem and it's thanking passengers for their patience. There's a big shakeup to health care in Atlantic Canada. New Brunswick's government says it has no choice but to cut back emergency departments in some rural communities. Critics fear people could die as a result. As Ross Lord reports, managing a struggling health care system isn't a problem unique to that part of Canada. With the New Brunswick health care system itself falling ill, the province has decided it's time for a radical remedy. We believe these changes will help address the lack of staff resources our system is experiencing. The toughest medicine, closing emergency departments overnight in six hospitals. But those hospitals are being promised additional mental health services. And 120 acute care beds are being converted to long-term chronic care beds, mostly for seniors awaiting nursing homes. The government says the emergency departments are only seeing a handful of patients overnight, many of them not actual emergencies. Underutilized capacity, when you can see at times two patients at night, when you can see 22 in the day, I think that's a good thing. Not so, according to people in Sackville near New Brunswick's border with Nova Scotia. Our biggest concern is deaths. A petition opposing the overnight closures at the Sackville Hospital is growing, with signatures rapidly outnumbering the town's population. We feel blindsided, our, our government officials feel blindsided, um, our, our representatives, um, and the public is just uh, floored. Finding better ways to deliver health care is urgent here in Atlantic Canada, which has the oldest population in the country. But researchers say other parts of Canada should be paying attention. The structure of health care is such that is going to affect all provinces. And in fact, most provinces have to deal with these kinds of issues. Health authorities say they've been asking for these changes for many years with more than one-third of the province's doctors and nurses eligible to retire within five years, they say changing the structure of health care makes perfect sense. Ross Lord, Global News, Halifax. There's more turmoil for the royal family, and it involves a Canadian. Autumn Phillips is divorcing the eldest grandson of Queen Elizabeth, Peter Phillips, after 12 years of marriage. In a statement, the couple says the separation is sad but amicable. They plan to share custody of their two daughters. The couple met in her hometown of Montreal while attending the Grand Prix in 2003. Five years later, she became the first Canadian to marry into the royal family. A frightening moment of impact caught on camera. Coming up, the ride to school these students will never forget. This distressing video shows the moment a school bus crashed and flipped on its side, sending students flying. It happened in December, and despite how bad it looks, no one was critically injured. Eight of the 25 students, though, and the 74-year-old driver did go to the hospital. The collision happened when another vehicle failed to stop at a red light. Police say the driver of that vehicle was driving 
with a suspended license. It is a big night in New Hampshire. The polls are now closed and voters in one of America's smallest states are hoping to make a big impact in the Democratic presidential race. Bernie Sanders is leading right now and Joe Biden is running way behind. The field of candidates got a bit smaller tonight. Andrew Yang announced he has dropped out of the race. As Jackson Prosco reports from New Hampshire, momentum for the remaining Democratic candidates now is crucial. The only thing certain about the first in the nation primary is the uncertainty felt by voters at the ballot box. This year has been so difficult to decide. Why is that? Because they're all over the place. I think a lot of the Democratic candidates are great and I probably could have voted for five of them, but it really just came down to who, who I really uh, agreed with. Many Democrats remained undecided up until the last moment, overwhelmed by a crowded field of candidates and the desire to defeat Donald Trump. I'm praying that he doesn't get in in November. So who's the person to beat him? It's got to be Biden or Sanders, somebody within the party. Got a box for you guys too. But Joe Biden's campaign appears to be faltering early, down in the polls and reportedly low on cash. We're still mildly hopeful here in New Hampshire, and we'll see what happens. All right. Biden left New Hampshire before the results were known to rally with supporters in South Carolina, where he hopes to turn things around. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Pete Buttigieg, the young former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, has grabbed many of Biden's voters. We need to pull off a big success, and it feels like it's shaping up well. Positioning himself as a moderate and electable. Alongside Senator Amy Klobuchar, who too has seen her numbers surge, she won two of New Hampshire's small precincts overnight. If the early votes, the midnight polls, are any uh, indication, we're going to have a pretty good night tonight. But it's the progressive wing of the party, led by Bernie Sanders, that could be on the path to a statewide victory. Buoyed by a strong showing in Iowa and legions of grassroots supporters nationwide. The guy is stuck to his roots from beginning to end. Jackson, all the polls close now. What are the early results? Well, Donna, with about a quarter of the results in, Bernie Sanders is in the lead. No surprise, he's from the neighborhood. Uh, Pete Buttigieg in second, but the breakout star of the night seems to be Amy Klobuchar. She was fifth after Iowa. Right now, she's in a very strong third-place position, a massive increase in numbers for her. And so, Donna, leaving the state, she may be one to watch while candidates like Joe Biden try to salvage their campaigns. All right. Lots to still watch for. Jackson in New Hampshire, thanks. Still ahead, the snowfall of a decade that is melting hearts. It's not often you can have a snowball fight in Baghdad. This is just the second time in a century Iraq's capital has seen snow. The last time was 2008. This wintry wonder is mostly melted now, but the snow brought a welcome moment of delight. A former dictator may finally face justice. Sudan's Omar al-Bashir may finally appear before the International Criminal Court, where he's charged with war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Bashir was ousted from power last April after nearly three decades of ruling the country with an iron fist. In a dramatic shift, Sudan's new government has promised to send anyone facing an ICC warrant to The Hague to face trial. The court issued warrants for Bashir's arrest in 2009 and 2010. He's accused of masterminding a scorched earth, earth campaign in the Darfur region that killed 300,000 people and forced nearly 3 million people from their homes. I'm Heather Urex West in Drumheller, Alberta, where paleontologists have discovered a new species of Tyrannosaur 13 million years older than T. rex. That story ahead on Global National. Fifteen wins in a row for the Toronto Raptors, a Canadian. And there you have it, a Canadian record for the Toronto Raptors. They beat the Minnesota Timberwolves in Toronto last night, giving them the longest winning streak in a single season by a major professional team based in Canada. The Calgary Stampeders held the record until now after 14 straight wins back in 2016. 
well, it's not a raptor, but it is Canadian, and it's making headlines around the world. A new dinosaur species has been discovered in Alberta. It's thought to be the oldest member of the T-Rex family, and just its name is enough to make you shudder. Heather Urich's West explains how the Reaper of Death was found. There's a reason why this monster is known as the King. The fierce T-Rex has inspired movies and captured our imagination for more than 100 years. But U of C researchers have now discovered another Tyrannosaur roamed the Earth millions of years before the mighty T-Rex hunted its prey. Thanatothrystes comes from a time period uh, that's roughly 79.5 million years old. Uh, so that's a rock layer which is the oldest point in Canada where we start getting dinosaur fossils. The fossilized skull fragments were first discovered in southern Alberta 10 years ago. But it wasn't until PhD student Jared Voris began studying the bones that he realized how special they were. I came by looking at it and noticed, that's when I started noticing the features that kind of made it distinct. A new species of tyrannosaur, much older than Canadian scientists had ever seen before. I think that's really important with this particular specimen is that it is the oldest tyrannosaur known from sort of northerly North America, which is really exciting because it tells us about a period of time that we know very little about dinosaur ecosystems. Paleontologists only know of two other dinosaurs from this period of time, a duckbill and a horned dinosaur. But as a vicious carnivore, Thanatos would have been at the top of the food chain. The animal would have been a typical tyrannosaur. So this means it's a two-legged animal with very short forelimbs, only two fingers on its hand, and the big massive skulls with big fat teeth. Thanatos was smaller than T-Rex, illustrating to scientists that as the species evolved, tyrannosaurs grew. Thanatos also looked a little different. It had a series of ornamental bumps on its snout. Of course, researchers are still trying to figure out why it lived here. Who else was around? Voris hopes to find those answers as he continues his career. Right now, though, he's focused on finishing that PhD. Heather Urex West, Global News, Drumheller, Alberta. And that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this coyote hanging out in Calgary. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. And thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.